epistaxis, the common nosebleed. It's one of those things that can be a tiny annoyance or, you know, a full-blown emergency. Right. And the difference really comes down to that first minute of assessment. So today, we're going to give you a really focused review on how to classify and manage these bleeds fast. That's exactly it. In an emergency setting, you need clarity. We're really just extracting one essential clinical distinction. Which is? Understanding the geography of the bleed. The site of the bleeding tells you everything about severity and what you need to do next. Okay. So let's start right there with that fundamental classification. The patient comes in. How do we divide epistaxis into those two categories? It's all about the nasal septum. That's the dividing line. It's either anterior in the front or posterior in the back. And that classification isn't just academic. Not at all. It's non-negotiable. Their vascular origins, the way they bleed, how you treat them, they're totally different worlds. You have to know which one you're dealing with instantly. Got it. So let's start with the 90% case. The common scenario, anterior bleeds. What's the specific spot that's responsible for almost all of these? We're talking about the anterior part of the nasal septum, specifically an area called Kieselbach's plexus. Sometimes called Little's area, right? It's Little's area. It's this um, high traffic junction where five different arteries all meet. And that's what makes it so vulnerable. So that concentration of vessels, what does that mean for how it bleeds? Well, it's a critical network. You have arteries from both the internal and external carotid systems feeding into it. So you'd think it would be a massive bleed. You would think, but the key is that the plexus itself is very superficial. It's mostly made of smaller vessels, venules, and capillaries. Ah, so it's a lower pressure system. It's a lower pressure system. So the bleeding is usually a steady ooze, not some dramatic torrent. And that's why simple direct pressure works almost every single time. Okay, so that's the takeaway for the 90%. Simple pressure, superficial origin. But when should we be skeptical? When does an anterior bleed make you nervous? That's a great question. I get nervous if the blood flow is really, really heavy. Right. Or if it just won't stop after, say, 15 minutes of good, solid pressure. Yeah. Also, if the patient says they're bleeding from both nostrils or if they have other health issues, yeah. you know, an underlying coagulopathy like a patient on a direct oral anticoagulant, that can turn a simple nosebleed into a real problem. Okay. Now for the other side of the coin, the severe 10%. The posterior bleeds, where do these come from? The posterior source is much, much deeper. It's coming from the back and top parts of the nasal cavity. And the vessel. The main culprit is almost always the stenopatine artery. It's a terminal branch of the maxillary artery. And that changes everything. It changes everything. We're now talking about a large caliber vessel, high pressure flow. When that ruptures, the bleeding is heavy, it's fast, and it does not respond to simple first aid. And the blood doesn't necessarily come out the front, does it? How do these patients usually present? No, it often doesn't. You'll see a massive amount of blood draining straight down the back of the throat, the pharynx. So they're swallowing it. They're swallowing blood, yeah. They often come in feeling nauseous, maybe they're vomiting or even spitting up blood. It can make it hard to even figure out where the source is at first. And these patients get sicker faster. Much faster. Because the source is so deep, your standard compression or anterior packing, it's just completely useless. You have to move to more invasive management right away. Which patients should make us immediately suspicious of a posterior bleed? Older patients. Definitely anyone over the age of 60. It's often due to age-related changes in mucosa. Plus, they just have more underlying health conditions. Like what specifically? We really worry about people with hypertension, those on anticoagulants or multiple antiplatelet drugs, and patients with known vascular diseases like atherosclerosis. In that group, a posterior bleed is a true medical emergency. Okay, before we get to management, let's talk triggers. Let's start with local factors. What are the things that directly affect the nose? The most common is just simple mechanical trauma. So a direct blow to the face or nose, for sure. But also, you know, repetitive damage. You mean nose picking? I mean, nose picking, digital trauma. It's a huge factor. Also, really dry or heated air, like in the winter, it dries out the mucosa making it crack and expose those superficial vessels. What else? Nasal infections, really bad allergic rhinitis where there's a lot of forceful blowing or sneezing, and uh, foreign bodies, especially in kids. And then there are the systemic causes. These are the ones that really drive recurrence and severity. Exactly. Systemic issues really fall into two buckets, circulatory and coagulatory. Let's start with circulatory. Hypertension is number one. High blood pressure puts a ton of stress on those little nasal arteries. It makes them more likely to rupture and much harder to clot once they do. And the second bucket, coagulatory. Right. Coagulopathies. 
This could be an inherited disorder like hemophilia or an acquired problem like severe liver disease. But honestly, most often in adults, it's medication-induced. Anticoagulants. Anticoagulants and antiplatelet medications. A patient on warfarin or a direct oral anticoagulant with a nosebleed, that raises the stakes immediately. Okay, let's shift to first aid. This is what we need to tell patients to do before they even get to us. What's the exact protocol? Precision is everything here. Step one, sit upright. Step two, lean slightly forward. This is so important to stop blood from going down the throat. Okay, sit up, lean forward, then what? Step three, pinch the soft part of the nose below the nasal bones. Use your thumb and index finger. Step four is to hold that pressure continuously for at least 10 to 15 minutes. By the clock? No peaking. No peaking. That's the biggest mistake people make. And finally, step five, you can apply cold compress to the bridge of the nose. It helps with vasoconstriction. I want to circle back to that posture. Sit up and lean forward. Why is tilting the head back so dangerous? Because the blood has nowhere to go but down the pharynx. The patient swallows it, which can cause nausea and vomiting. Vomiting spikes your blood pressure and can restart the bleed. And worse. And worse. If they have an altered mental status, the risk of aspiration is huge. You can turn a simple nosebleed into a respiratory emergency. Okay, so that's first aid. Now, for us as providers, what are the absolute red flags that mean stop home care, come to the hospital now? First is duration. If it's bleeding for more than 20 minutes despite good continuous pressure, that's a red flag. And second. Any sign of hemodynamic instability. Dizziness, a rapid pulse, low blood pressure looking pale. That means significant blood loss. What about trauma? Absolutely. Any bleeding after a significant head or facial trauma requires immediate evaluation. We have to rule out more serious injuries. And finally, any bleed in a patient on anticoagulants or with a known bleeding disorder, they need to be seen. All right, let's say they're in the hospital. First aid has failed. What's the initial approach? First, we make sure they're stable, of course. ABCs. Then, we typically use cotton pledgets soaked in a topical vasoconstrictor, like oxymetazoline, and some lidocaine for anesthetic. Let that sit for 5 or 10 minutes. To calm things down and let you see. Exactly. It lets you visualize the source. If you can see a specific vessel in that anterior septum, we move to cauterization. And you have a couple options there. Two main options. Chemical cautery, usually with silver nitrate sticks. It's quick and works well for small visible vessels. Is there a trick to it? The clinical pearl is to only cauterize one side of the septum at a time. If you do both sides in the same spot, you risk septal perforation. What's the other option? Electrical cautery. That's for larger anterior vessels, or if the silver nitrate doesn't work. And if you can't see a single source, or the bleeding is more diffuse? Then we move to nasal packing. That's the mechanical approach. For anterior bleeds, we might use something absorbable like Surgicel or non-absorbable like a Maricel sponge or a rapid rhino balloon. They just provide direct pressure. Now for the toughest one, a confirmed posterior bleed. How does the packing change? Posterior packing is way more complex. It almost always means admission to the hospital, probably to a monitor dead. We use specialized balloon catheters that have a second larger balloon that sits in the nasopharynx to compress the artery. And there are risks with that. Big risks. It can compromise the airway or irritate nerves and cause a drop in heart rate and blood pressure. These patients need to be watched very closely. And if even that fails, we're talking about a surgery. We are. For refractory posterior bleeds, the gold standard now is endoscopic sphenopalatine artery ligation. So you go in through the nose with the scope. Exactly. You find the artery as it exits the pterygopalatine fossa and you clip it. It has a success rate over 95%, much better than the old external approaches. So we have this clear progression, cautery, then packing, then ligation. But no matter what you do, you have to address the underlying problem. Absolutely. It's like patching a tire without fixing the faulty pressure gauge. If the patient is hypertensive, you have to get that blood pressure under control. If they're on anticoagulants, you have to have a serious discussion about the risks and benefits. Those systemic factors are the root cause of recurrence. So this has been a really focused review. We've laid out the 90% rule. Most bleeds are anterior from Kieselbach's plexus and easy to control. Right. And the critical 10% are posterior coming from that high pressure sphenopalatine artery and require much more advanced care. Understanding that distinction is everything. That's the takeaway. But I'll leave you with one final thought. Yeah. We focused on stopping the bleed, but the work doesn't stop there. If you have a patient with recurrent epistaxis, especially an older adult, it is not just a nose problem. You have to be a detective. Meaning? Meaning, 
you must investigate those systemic diseases, uncontrolled hypertension, an undiagnosed liver issue, a coagulopathy. That systemic workup is often the missing piece that prevents the next, and potentially much worse, episode.